This week, our activities, content, and assignments will help you be able to do the following. One, model a volcanic caldera. Two, discover how hotspots form. Three, calculate the rate of plate motion. Four, discuss potential volcanic hazards. Five, understand how and why volcanoes form, different volcanic settings, and their link to plate tectonics. Six, learn how calderas form, the main controls that determine how much elevation is lost during an eruption, and why some volcanoes are more explosive than others. And seven, understand the concept of hotspot volcanism and how we can use it as a tool to determine plate motion through time. First, we'll start with some background information to provide you context for this week's lab. A volcano can be defined as a vent in the crust of a planetary body or moon from which eruptions of molten rock, hot rock fragments, and hot gases escape. Like we've talked about in previous labs, volcanism is related to plate tectonics. There are three types of volcanism. Each one comes from a different tectonic setting. Convergent boundary volcanism, divergent boundary volcanism, and hotspot volcanism. We'll discuss each of these in more detail in the following slides. Convergent boundaries occur when two plates collide. We have two subtypes of convergent boundaries that result in volcanism. One, the convergence of two oceanic plates, and two, the convergence of an oceanic plate and a continental plate. First, we'll take a closer look at oceanic-oceanic convergent boundaries. When two oceanic plates collide, the older, denser oceanic plate will subduct beneath the younger, less dense oceanic plate. When this happens, the water from the subducting oceanic plate is squeezed out into the hot upper mantle. Water lowers the melting temperature of rock, allowing for magma to form underneath the overriding plate. This type of magma generation is known as flux melting. The difference in density causes the magma to rise to the surface, generating volcanic island arcs. Because both plates involved are oceanic and therefore mafic, the magma generated in these settings is also mafic. Examples of this tectonic setting can be seen in the Philippines and the Aleutian Islands. Next, we'll take a closer look at continental oceanic convergent boundaries. When an oceanic plate collides with a continental plate, the dense oceanic plate will subduct beneath the less dense continental plate. Like we saw with volcanic island arcs, the water from the subducting oceanic plate is squeezed out into the hot upper mantle, leading to magma generated via flux melting. The difference in density causes the magma to rise to the surface, generating volcanic continental arcs. Because one plate is oceanic, and thus mafic, and one plate is continental, and thus felsic, the resulting magma will likely be intermediate in composition. This is because part of the continental plate melts and mixes with the mafic magma from the oceanic plate. Examples of this tectonic setting can be seen in the Andes Mountains in South America and the Cascade Mountains of the northwestern U.S. The next tectonic, the next tectonic setting that, we, that can generate volcanism is divergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries occur when two plates move apart from each other in opposite directions. We have two subtypes of divergent boundaries that result in volcanism. One, the divergence of two oceanic plates, and two, the divergence of continental plates. Divergent boundaries between continental plates cause crustal thinning. As the crust thins and mantle material rises due to convection currents in the mantle, the mantle material begins to melt and form magma. This process is known as decompression melting. Eventually, the crust becomes so thin that magma can break through the surface, creating a series of volcanoes. Because part of the continental plate will melt and mix with the mafic magma from the mantle, the magma in these settings tends to be intermediate to felsic in composition. An example of this is the East African Rift. Divergent boundaries between oceanic plates cause mid-ocean ridges. At mid-ocean ridges, molten material moves up through underwater volcanic mountain chains across our planet. This magma, which also results from decompression melting, is mafic in composition. 
An example of this setting would be the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Hotspots are areas where plumes of hot mantle material rise and melt through the lithosphere. This causes volcanic activity at the surface. Hotspots are caused by mantle plumes that stem from deep in the mantle, not by plate tectonics. Magma in these cases forms from decompression melting. As the magma rises, decreased pressure causes melting. Hotspots can be located anywhere on a tectonic plate, and the location might change based on how the plate is moving. It's important to note that the mantle plume itself doesn't move, it's just the plate that moves over top of it. Hotspots remain mostly static over long periods of time, with the plates moving across them. As the plates move, new volcanoes form over a long period of time, will create a chain of volcanoes that follow the direction of plate motion. Hotspot volcano chains are extremely useful for determining the direction and rate of plate motion. Hotspot volcanism is different depending on the type of tectonic plate involved. A hotspot under a continental plate will generate a series of volcanoes across the landscape. As you can see in this example, the volcanoes increase in age in the same direction as plate movement. Because part of the continental plate melts and mixes with the magma, the composition of this magma is going to be intermediate to felsic, making these volcanoes explosive. An excellent example of a hotspot beneath a continental plate is shown, again in this figure, in Yellowstone. A hotspot beneath an oceanic plate, however, will have mafic magma. This type of volcanism results in the formation of volcanic island chains. One of the most famous examples of hotspot volcanism in an oceanic plate is the Hawaiian Islands. Each island began as a volcano connected to the mantle plume. Eventually, enough lava cooled and built up that the island rose above sea level. As the plate moves, the existing volcano is cut off from its magma source and a new volcano forms above the hotspot. Generally, we classify volcanoes into two different types, stratovolcanoes and shield volcanoes. Shield volcanoes are typically shallow-sided, shield-shaped volcanoes that have frequent, gentle, or non-explosive eruptions. The lava ejected is very high in temperature, which lowers the viscosity, meaning it makes the lava more runny or less resistant to flow which in turn allows the lava to flow very quickly. The low percentage of dissolved gases means that most of these eruptions are non-explosive. This type of volcano can eventually collapse to form calderas. Stratovolcanoes are typically steep-sided, cone-shaped volcanoes that have violent, explosive eruptions. The lava ejected is highly viscous, or extremely resistant to flow. Lava here is much cooler and more viscous than that of shield volcanoes. The explosive nature of stratovolcanoes is due in part to the high percentage of dissolved gases and magma moving through the vents of the volcano. This type of volcano can also collapse to form calderas. The change in elevation a volcano undergoes due to an eruption is predominantly determined by the size of the eruption and the size of the magma chamber. Prior to eruption, a volcano is supported by its magma chamber. If you remove or erupt a large amount of magma very quickly, then the pressure support is no longer there, which then causes the volcano to sink in the empty space that was previously occupied by the magma prior to the eruption. Perhaps one of the best examples of a stratovolcano collapsing to form a caldera can be seen at Crater Lake National Park. This volcano occurred as the result of an oceanic continental convergent boundary. At this boundary, the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting beneath the North American plate. The flux melting generated magma here from this subduction zone is responsible for the formation of the Cascade Mountain Range, of which... Mount Mazama, where Crater Lake sits atop of, is part. 
Mount Mazama began to grow half a million years ago. By about 8,000 years ago, Mount Mazama may have stood as much as 12,000 feet uh, tall. The volcano's most violent eruption occurred about 7,700 years ago. 12 cubic miles of material poured out of the volcano, draining the magma chamber beneath it. As the underlying support for the mountain was lost, the walls of the volcano began to collapse inward. The top of a mountain that was built over hundreds of thousands of years probably disappeared in the span of a few days. Over the course of several hundred years following the creation of the caldera, rain and snow filled the basin to a depth of almost 2,000 feet. Today, Crater Lake is the nation's deepest lake. To determine how much of the volcano collapsed, you'll need measurements before the eruption occurred. Specifically, you'd need volcano height, total elevation. After the collapse, you would need to measure the new height and the new elevation. You'll also want the depth and the width of the new caldera. Next, we'll discuss information that you'll need to complete this lab. In this lab, you'll need safety goggles that will be provided by your TA. There are no helpful hints specific to this lab. Physical supplies that you'll need. Your table group will need at least one laptop or tablet for the Google Earth portion of this exercise. Your TA will provide all materials for the Caldera experiment, including safety goggles, the sandbox, a ruler, a balloon, and a binder clip. Finally, procedure and worksheets are available for download on Carmen, but you can also bring these as a physical supply. Digital supplies. You will need to use Google Earth for this lab. All KMZ files are available in the instruction page on Carmen. The procedure and worksheets are also available for download on Carmen. These instructions can be found in the procedure document, but I'd like to go over them before everyone gets started. First, you'll inflate the balloon to about the size of a softball and tie it off. Then, you'll push the sand in the box out of the center, making a small depression about the size of the balloon. Next, you'll build a volcano on top of your balloon, making sure there is sufficient sand on top of the balloon, approximately half to one inch. Ask your TA for some water if the sand will not hold on its own. Four, sketch a drawing of the volcano in the box on your sheet. Make sure to accurately represent dimensions and include a scale. Record the height, elevation, depth, and width. Make sure you put on your safety goggles before you pop the balloon. After the collapse, measure and sketch your new caldera. <laughs> 